اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم لیسن نمبر 101 سورة الانفال آیا نمبر 59 تو 75 ولا يحسبن الذین کفروا سبقوا انہم لا يعجزون and let not those who disbelieve think they will escape why because indeed they will not cause failure to Allah they can never defeat the plan of Allah لا يحسبن he should never think like this he should never assume like this who الذين كفروا those people who have disbelieved they should never think that سبقوا they have escaped Sabaqu is from the root letter seen ba qaf and sabaqa is to proceed it is to go to get ahead of someone so basically in a competition in a race where one goes ahead of the other this is what sabaqa is from the same root is the word sabaq which is for a lesson why because with each lesson you move forward you go ahead So the disbelievers should never think that they have gone ahead. What does it mean by this? That they have won against Allah and the Messenger and the believers by escaping the battlefield safely. Because remember, at the Battle of Badr, a thousand mushrikeen came. Seventy were killed, seventy were taken as captives. The rest of them, who were many in number, They're being told over here that don't think you have escaped Allah. Don't think you have caused failure to Allah. That you have come back home all safe and sound? No. Never think that you're safe. Never think that you have defeated Allah and the Messenger. Why? Because إِنَّهُمْ لَا يُعْجِزُونَ Indeed in reality the disbelievers, they can never make helpless. Who? Allah. They can never make the plan of Allah defeated. يُعْجِزُونَ is from يُعْجِزُ أَعْجَزَ يُعْجِزُ which means to make someone incapable to defeat someone else so they can never defeat the plan of Allah they can never avoid the punishment of Allah so over here indirectly the believers are being addressed that the might the multitude the success of the disbelievers it should not worry you the fact that they have gone back home safe Or the fact that they have so much money, the fact that there are so many in number, never think, never become grieved because of that. Never think that because of this reason they will be successful. Because momentarily, they are successful. They may have escaped, they may have saved themselves. They may have outstripped the believers with regards to worldly affairs. However, in reality, they cannot cause failure to the deen of Allah. Why? Because Allah has sent His deen so that it overcomes all other religions. They cannot defeat the religion of Allah. They cannot defeat the plan of Allah. In Surah At-Tawbah, ayah number 33, we learn, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُظْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ It is He who has sent His messenger with guidance and the religion of truth. Why? To manifest it over all religions. Even if the mushrikeen dislike this. Even if they dislike the fact that Allah's religion is being dominant. Even if they try to oppose it. So, O believers, never be impressed by the disbelievers. Never think that if today they're successful, they will always be successful. No. Success is not decreed for them. إِنَّهُمْ لَا يُعْجِزُونَ When people see The temporary defeat of the Muslims, what do they think? That Islam will eventually be eliminated. It's a conspiracy against Muslims and Islam to completely eliminate the Muslims, to completely eliminate the religion of Islam. But never get baffled by these incidents. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, إِنَّهُمْ لَا يُعْجِزُونَ They can never defeat the plan of Allah. They can never become Victorious. They could never eliminate the light of Allah. So what do we learn from this ayah? First of all, that the one who does wrong never prospers. Never. Even if apparently 
in the worldly sense, he may seem to be successful. The one who does wrong never prospers. He never becomes successful. Therefore, never envy the person who is doing wrong and despite that is prospering in the dunya. Because sometimes what happens, we see someone who is dealing with riba, who is doing something haram. And we see they have earned so much money. They are so successful. And sometimes we become envious. For example, there could be two friends, three or four people who have studied together in school. Upon graduation, one of them does not care about what is halal, what is haram. He takes a job position in which the earning is completely haram. He doesn't care. And he's making so much money. And the other person, he restricts himself in the conditions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him. And because of that, his options are limited. And he takes a job, for instance, in which the earning is completely halal. However, the money is not that much. So in this situation, he should never become envious of the one who is making more money. Never. Because that person is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if momentarily the other person seems to be successful despite his disobedience to Allah, never have this anger in your heart that this is not fair. That they're disobeying Allah. They're doing haram and look at them, they're so successful. And me, I'm struggling so much and here I am still where I was before. It happens with many people. For example, girls are told, take off your hijab, you'll get married. You look so beautiful. But she puts on her hijab. And when she does not get married for a while, people say, see, it's because of your hijab. See, because you went and did al-huda course. Because you studied the Qur'an. You don't have a career. What does Allah say? That don't get impressed by these people. Don't. Somebody who's doing something wrong, temporarily he may seem to be successful. Don't be envious in your heart. Don't be upset in your heart. Because that person will never be successful. You will be successful. Even if right now you may have to suffer some harm. Because what Allah has in store for you is much better than what these people are enjoying right now through haram, through unlawful means, through acts of disobedience. So never become upset, never become envious of those people who are doing something wrong. We learn in Surah Al-Ankabut, ayah number 4. أَمْ حَسِبَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السَّيِّئَاتِ أَنْ يَسْبِقُونَ سَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ or do those people who do evil deeds think that they can outrun us? They can defeat us? They can defeat our plan? Evil is what they judge. Because never can a person who disobeys Allah be successful. Never. What happened to Fir'aun? What happened to the people of Lut? What happened to so many people before? Each and every one of them was finished, was destroyed. So never be impressed by those people who do wrong. In Surah Ali Imran, Ayah 196-197, we learn, لا يغرنك تقلب الذين كفروا في البلاد Be not deceived by the movement of the disbelievers throughout the land, that they freely move about from this country to that country, this land to that land. Freely they're traveling without any problems. So it should not deceive you. Why? Because it is mata'un qalilun. It is but a small enjoyment. ثُمَّ مَأْوَاهُمْ جَهَنَّمُ وَبِئْسَ الْمِهَادِ Then their final refuge is hell and wretched is the resting place. So what if they can enjoy traveling today without any restrictions? And when you have to travel, you have to go through so much difficulty. So what? What's the big deal? So what if you cannot go to one country? Maybe you cannot go to three countries. What's the big deal? The land of Allah is so huge. So don't be deceived by the freedom of who? Those people who disobey Allah. Because they can never be successful. Never. وَأَعِدُّوا لَهُمْ And instead, you should prepare for them. أَعِدُّوا from the root letters عَيْن دَال دَال عَدَد What does عَدَد mean? Number. And إِعْدَاد is to prepare something for the future. And it is to fully prepare when you are fully done with your preparation, can you count the things that you've prepared? Can you? Yes, you can. Because you're fully prepared. You can count them. For example, if you're having a dinner in your house and people are coming and you're fully prepared, what does it mean? You will have all the dishes counted. 
Even the cutlery counted. Even the chair is counted. Isn't it so? Even the hangers for people to hang their jackets. People go to such details. So what does it mean? You're fully prepared. So a'iddu, prepare lahum for them, meaning for fighting the enemy. Mastatartum min quwwatin. Whatever you are able of quwwa. Do your best to prepare yourself for war in the future against your enemy. The battle of Badr was the first battle. And from this now, the Muslims are being taught that for the future, be ready. Be ready. This was just the beginning. This was just the beginning. In the future, there will be many more combats between you and your enemy. So right now, what are you supposed to do? Prepare. This battle of Badr, they went into unprepared. Isn't it so? The circumstances were created such that the Muslims, they were forced into it. For the future, make sure you're prepared. What has been said over here? First of all, prepare whatever you're capable of, whatever that you can muster. Of what? Firstly, quwwah, strength. What does quwwah mean? Strength, power. And in the context of war, Quwa refers to everything that strengthens you for battle. Everything that strengthens you for battle. Whether it is something physical or intangible. For example, when it comes to tangible, when it comes to physical means of strengthening yourself for battle, what does it refer to? First of all, manpower. You have to have the people. If you don't have people, then how will you go for battle? You have to have the people. Similarly, this includes weapons, military power, military might, arms. Similarly, it includes training the people. Because if you have a mob of people, you have a great number of people, and they're not prepared, they're not trained, what good are they? What use are they? Not at all useful. And if you have a few individuals even, who are fully skilled and prepared, they're much better. So, Preparation, tangible quwa, includes training that is given to who? The soldiers. And tangible quwa includes al-rami. What does al-rami mean? Archery, shooting. To shoot from a distance or at a distance. What's the evidence for that, that quwa includes al-rami? From a hadith which is reported in Sahih Muslim as well as in Musnad Ahmad. It is reported that Uqba ibn Amir, he said that he heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa saying while standing on the mimbar and he recited this ayah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ala inna al-quwwata ar-ramyu. Inna al-quwwata ar-ramyu. Verily, strength is what? Ar-rami. Archery. Now you may wonder, archery is with arrows, right? So that was probably relevant at that time. Later on, when people don't use arrows, then what does it mean by arami? Anything which is a means of shooting. Whether it is through guns or tanks or whatever. The Prophet ﷺ said that lands shall be thrown open to you. Lands shall be thrown open to you. And Allah will suffice you against your enemies. But none of you should give up playing with his arrows. None of you should give up playing with his arrows. And Umar رضي الله عنه, he said that teach your children three skills. Swimming, archery, and horseback. Why? Because if you know these three skills, then you can save your life. If you fall into the water, you can swim. If you can drive a car, and if you can ride a horse, then you can also save yourself again. If you can shoot, whether it is shooting at an animal or a specific target, throwing an arrow or throwing a net or throwing a rock or something like a rope, something like that, you can save your life with it. So these skills are necessary, are very important. So quwa first of all includes tangible quwa. And secondly, it includes intangible quwa. And what does intangible quwa refer to? The strength of the heart, iman, skill. Courage. So prepare against them quwa. And this quwa 
could be physical, could be intangible, whatever is relevant to the needs of that time. Whatever is relevant to the situation that the believers are in. Whatever is relevant to the era. وَمِنْ رِبَاطِ الْخَيْلِ And also from horses. But what kind of horses? Steeds of war. Meaning also prepare steeds of war. رِبَاط is from the root that is رَبَاطَ And رَبْط is to tie something. What does رَبْط mean? To tie. To bond. And الخيل, what does خيل mean? Horses. رباط الخيل is a band of horses. What does it mean? A band of horses. Steeds of war. Band of horses. Cavalry. And رباط is also for guarding the borders. Remember? اصبروا وصابروا ورابطوا From that I told you about the meaning of the word رباط. What does ribat mean? To guard the borders. And for that, what is needed? Horses. Isn't it so? And if you're guarding the borders, you will have your horses ready. And your horses are tied up if they're ready. So ribat al-khayl, meaning your horses are ready, they're trained, they're tied up, so that as soon as you need them, you just sit on them and go. So have your steeds of war ready. What do horses symbolize? Transportation. Isn't it? They symbolize transportation. Therefore, it does not just apply to horses, but all other means of transport for the purpose of battle, for the purpose of war. Whether it is in the form of jets or ships, transport through land, sea, or air, whatever means of transportation you can muster, muster it all together, prepare it together. However, remember that despite that, horses are still very important because even today horses are used to access certain areas which you cannot access through your tanks or through any other means. Isn't it so? So Ribat al-Khayr is relevant even in today's time and even in the future. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many creatures and all of them they are created for the benefit of human beings. Some we eat, some we look at, some are used for different reasons and some are used for the purpose of transportation. And of all the creatures, the one that is of greatest virtue is the horse. There are many ahadiths which tell us about the virtue of the horse. For example, there is a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said that good will remain in the forelocks of horses until the day of resurrection. Good will remain in the forelocks of horses until the day of resurrection. Meaning it's tied to horses. They are a means of obtaining good until the day of resurrection. So prepare your horses as well. Why should you have your quwah ready and your horses ready? Why should you have your strength prepared as well as your transport prepared? Turhibu nabihi aduwallah Through which you frighten the enemy of Allah. Turhibuna from the root letters rahaba. Rahab. What does rahab mean? To fear. So when you are prepared for battle, even if you're not going for battle, what are you going to do? You're going to frighten your enemy. وَعَدُوَّكُمْ You're going to frighten who? Your enemy, who is also the enemy of Allah. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, what does it refer to? The mushrikeen of Mecca, the kuffar. And later on, anyone who opposes Islam. When you are prepared for battle, when you have a strong army, when you have a strong group of soldiers, you're physically prepared, then what's going to happen? Your enemy is going to think twice before attacking you. وَآخَرِينَ And also others. Meaning there are also others whom you're going to terrify with your preparation for war. آخَرِينَ مِن دُونِهِمْ Others who are besides them. Besides who? Who does them refer to? عَدُوَ اللَّهُ وَعَدُوَّكُمْ Who are these people? This is the enemy that is hidden. That is unknown to you right now. The mushrikeen of Mecca, they had displayed their hostility against the Muslims. It was obvious that they were enemies to Muslims. Isn't it so? It was quite clear. But there were some other people who were also enemies to Islam, but they hadn't shown their enmity. So when you are prepared, when you're always prepared for battle, 
whether or not you're going for battle, what is it going to do? Your enemy is going to be scared of you. And at the same time, others who have enmity against you, even they will be terrified of you. So you will be protecting yourself from the overt as well as the covert enemy. The apparent as well as the hidden enemy. You will protect yourself from them. And this enemy is such that لا تعلمونهم You don't even know them. Because they're hidden. They don't express their enmity. And who are these people? Who is this enemy who is hidden? It can refer to the munafiqun, the hypocrites. It can also refer to the Yahud. Because initially they had a treaty with the Muslims. Isn't it so? And later on they proved their hostility against the Muslims. So لا تعلمونهم You don't know them. That they're in reality your enemy. Allah يَعْلَمُهُمْ Allah knows them really well. وَمَا تُنْفِقُوا مِنْ شَيْءٍ And whatever you spend of anything في سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ In the way of Allah Whether it is a little or a lot But over here especially سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ means For the purpose of battle يُوَفَّ إِلَيْكُمْ It will be given to you fully وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تُظْلَمُونَ And you will not be wronged So when you spend in the cause of Allah When you give even a penny in the cause of Allah Then it will be given back to you It will be returned to you Where? In the hereafter and sometimes even in the dunya, and you will not be wronged at all. Because a person who spends even one thing in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the reward is multiplied for him. So there is no injustice done against him. What do we learn in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 261? That مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ The example of those people who spend their wealth in the way of Allah is like that of a grain. أَنْبَتَتْ سَبْعَ سَنَابِلَ فِي كُلِّ سُنْبُلَةٍ مِئَةُ حَبَّةٍ It grows seven ears and each ear has a hundred grains. One is multiplied into seven hundred. وَاللَّهُ يُضَاعِفُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءَ And Allah multiplies a reward for whoever He wills. وَاللَّهُ وَاسِعٌ عَلِيمٌ And Allah is vast and He's also knowing. So what do we learn from this ayah? That the believers... After the battle of Badr, they were told to always remain prepared for battle. Even if they're not going for battle. Why? Two objectives. So that you can cast fear into the heart of your enemy. And as a result of that, they don't dare to fight against you. And secondly, those people who don't even show their enmity to you right now, even they are afraid of fighting against you. They will not dare to speak against you. And from this we learn for ourselves that we should take our protection, our precaution through whatever means that we can. So that other people cannot dare to harm us in any way. It is a part of defending yourself. So it's necessary on the part of individuals that they must train themselves so that they can defend themselves. You understand? Train yourself in a way that you can defend yourself. Always be prepared. For example, if a woman takes a self-defense course, what are you doing in that? Training as to how to defend yourself in a situation where somebody is attacking you. Is that necessary? You might say that, no, it's not necessary for me. But it is very important. Because you don't know what might happen tomorrow. So if you have the skill, especially if you have the time and you have the skill, then you must use it. If Allah has given you the opportunity, learn. So that you can defend yourself. Because defending yourself, saving your life is an obligation upon you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن جَنَحُوا لِسِلْمِ And if they incline to a silm. What does silm mean? Peace. Meaning, if the enemy inclines to a peace treaty, then what should you do? فَجْنَحْ لَهَا Then incline towards it. Ijnah is from the word janah. What does janah mean? Wing. Janah. Not janah. Janah. Wing. So what do you do with the wing? Bend it. So if the enemy inclines towards peace, then what should you do? Accept that offer. فَجْنَحْ لَهَا وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ And trust upon Allah. إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Indeed, He is hearing and He is knowing. So what do we learn from this? That prepare for battle, be ready. However, if the enemy offers peace to you, then accept peace. Because our religion promotes peace, not war. And this is the evidence of that. Be prepared. But if the enemy, despite being a very hostile enemy, offers peace, accept it. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ accepted the peace treaty from the mushrikeen when? At Hudaybiyah. 
even though the clauses of that treaty were apparently against the Muslims. But he accepted them. Why? Because peace is better than war. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us. Let's listen to the recitation of these verses. وَلَا يَحْسَبًا We'll do a quick review of these ayat and then we'll continue the lesson. وَأَعِدُّوا لَهُمْ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةِ And prepare against them whatever that you are able of power as well as وَمِنْ رِبَاطِ الْخَيْلِ and of steeds of war. Over here the believers are being commanded that they must prepare themselves for possible encounter with the mushrikeen, with the non-Muslims in the future, in battle. What does it show? The importance of preparing yourself for something that might happen, for something that is inevitable, for something that you've gone through recently. And right after the Battle of Badr, which was the first major battle, the Muslims are told, for the future, be prepared. Because at the Battle of Badr, the circumstances were made such, they were put into the situation, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aided them, and they came out of that successfully. But for the future, you have to be prepared. You have to be prepared. And two things are told over here for preparation. And what are they? First of all, quwa. Muster up all that you can of quwa. Whether it is physical strength or it is mental strength. Because remember, quwa includes tangible as well as intangible strength. So this includes having numbers, having people who are prepared and skilled, having arms, having ammunition, as well as people who have the strength of iman. Because a person could be physically able, very able. However, if in his iman he is weak, then how can he fight only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He cannot. Both are necessary. So quwa has to be there. And secondly, وَمِرْ رِبَاطِ الْخَيْلِ Which symbolizes a means of transportation. Why should you do so, even if you're not going for battle? تُرْهِبُونَ بِهِ عَدُوَ اللَّهِ Through it, you are going to frighten who? The enemy of Allah. As well as وَعَدُوَّكُمْ And also your enemy. Because when you're prepared, then your enemy will not dare to harm you, will not dare to attack you. وَآخَرِينَ And also by this, you will be able to frighten who? Others who are مِن دُونِهِمْ Besides them. Besides who? Besides your enemy. Meaning the enemy who is hidden from you. لا تعلمونهم You don't know them, but who knows them? الله يعلمهم Allah knows them very well. And obviously, when you're spending your money, when you're spending your time preparing yourself for battle, then obviously, it's possible that some people might think that we're wasting our money. Why do we have to spend? Because remember that when the Muslims would go to battle, what money would they spend? Their own personal money. Their own personal money. So over here the believers are encouraged that وَمَا تُنْفِقُوا مِنْ شَيْءٍ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Anything that you spend in the way of Allah, whether it is your time or your energy or your wealth, whatever you spend, يُوَفَّ إِلَيْكُمْ It will be given back to you. وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تُظْلَمُونَ And you will not be wronged. So anything you spend in the way of Allah, do not think it's going waste. Never think that what you're spending in the way of Allah is going waste. For example, if you're spending some time studying, a year and a half studying the deen of Allah, don't think that time of your life is going waste. Or the money that you're spending to gain that knowledge, don't think that money is going waste. It's a big investment. A big investment. Why? Because Allah is saying you will get it back. When? In the hereafter. And you will not be wronged at all. Not at all. Just like when a person goes to university in order to gain some worldly knowledge, he spends so much money, but what is he told? It's an investment that you're making. Isn't it? People will spend thousands of dollars just to get one certification. One certification. They will spend so much money just to get one title. But what are they told? This is an investment. In the future, you will make more money. You will gain more benefit. So anything you spend in the way of Allah... That is also an investment because Allah is saying you will get it back and you will not be wronged at all.